So let's go over a case history. This is a real case history. This patient has not had treatment with a PARP inhibitor, but I think she shows a lot of the characteristics of hereditary breast cancer and triple negative breast cancer. So she was diagnosed with breast cancer at age 55 and uh, noticed a palpable mass. Her, uh, her mammogram was negative, so the tumor did not show up on the mammogram. Her um, tumor markers were all negative, so she was triple negative. And she uh, was diagnosed with an inflammatory breast cancer, so she got neoadjuvant chemotherapy. But we used the standard drugs, adriamycin, cytoxin, and uh, taxotere. She then went to surgery, and at surgery, she had a residual five centimeter tumor, and she had five axillary nodes positive. So even though she had pretty extensive neoadjuvant chemotherapy, she did not get a real good hist uh, histologic or pathologic uh, response. Um, so after she had recovered from her surgery, she was then being evaluated for chest wall radiation. Um, and it turned out that she had developed a skin recurrence at that time, as well as some um, chest adenopathy. So we held the radiation and we put her back on chemo, but we chose different drugs. And so this time, Taxol with Avastin, and then we added Carboplatin as well. She had a nice response to that. And then we went ahead with the chest wall radiation. Um, she still had disease, so we uh, continued chemotherapy with Gemzar and then Navalbine. And about a year later from her recurrence now, she has developed a remission. So that she's had a really nice response. She's kind of beaten the odds already right there. But she's likely to recur, and when she does recur, we've used all the good drugs that we have for triple negative breast cancer. The question would be, well, then what are you going to do? And so she would potentially be a very good candidate for um, treatment with a PARP inhibitor. This is her family history, and um, our patient is right here with the arrow. And her sister was diagnosed with um, bilateral breast cancer um, here. And so right there, if you have two sisters with breast cancer, even though I think both of them were postmenopausal, it makes you wonder about a hereditary basis. And then on her mother's side, there was a question of maybe the grandmother had ovary cancer, weren't really sure about that, and weren't able to really prove that. So if that were true, then you have um, two generations of a breast or ovary cancer. So it made us wonder whether um, she could be a, a mutation carrier. And we have a program called the BRCA Pro, and this looks at the family tree. And it um, said that there's about a 17% probability we would find a mutation in BRCA1 or 2 that's hereditary if we tested um, our patient or her sister. So her sister actually went, underwent testing first here, and they did find a mutation in the BRCA1 gene. Uh, inherited uh, germline mutation. So once we know what that gene deletion or a mutation is, we can then test other members in the family, including the men and including children of, of someone who's a carrier if they're uh, over age 18 for that mutation. And so that's what we did. And uh, so my patient, she did, was positive for this deleterious mutation in the BRCA1 gene. So that, that makes sense. You have triple negative breast cancer, family history, so um, she's a carrier of a uh, germline BRCA1 mutation. Any questions about all that? Why do you have to wait until 18 to test the kids? Well, usually we wait until they're a considered legal adult, um, and in this um, syndrome, the cancers generally occur um, after age 18. Some can occur younger. So you, you can test younger, but then you need to have parental consent and go through a little bit more uh, risk benefit with that. So generally, we would not test until 18 unless there was some compelling reason to think that a person was at risk before that. OK, so that's part one. And let's see, I get to part two. So now let's talk a little bit about these PARP inhibitors. What are they? 
Well, um, we know that in cancer, um, cells grow and then they grow without control of that um, balance. So you get cell proliferation that's unregulated. Um, now, when our cells divide, we often end up with damage in the DNA. So we get single strand and double strand breaks in the DNA. And we've learned that um, that can cause cancer, but now maybe we can use that to try to treat the cancer. So it turns out that the proteins of BRCA1 and BRCA2 are involved in DNA repair. That's why uh, if you don't have them, we think you're at higher risk of developing cancer. <laughs> PARP is an enzyme that's also involved in DNA repair and either base excision or sing single strand repair. And these <laughs> poly-ADP ribose polymerase enzymes, it's a, it's a large family of enzymes actually, and they're just beginning to explore what they do in cancer. But it turns out this PARP type of enzyme um, has been around a long time, and those are what account for the toxins in some bacteria. So the toxin in uh, cholera, toxin in diphtheria are actually PARP enzymes. So kind of interesting. And there's a concept called synthetic lethality that's very popular now and will become, you know, I think, uh, more of a common um, knowledge and subject as uh, we get more into this. And that uh, concept is that if you have, you might have two genes that have a synthetic lethal relationship. So what does that mean? That means that you can have a mutation in either one of the two genes, but that won't kill the cell, okay? But if you have a mutation in both genes, then that cell cannot survive and it will die. And so that's the concept behind using PARP inhibitors in conjunction with patients that have a, uh, who do not have active BRCA1 or 2 protein, either by a hereditary uh, related cancer or triple negative breast cancer where, where those proteins are turned off.